So uh, today we'll be talking about Linux forensics. I'm sorry I won't be able to give the IoT talk. Uh, I hope uh, this might be interesting. Uh, so we're going to talk about how would you go about doing forensics on Linux systems? Uh, what are, uh, how do you hide, hide your data? Uh, how do you find hidden data? Uh, how do you look at browser history and uh, what to do if there's base 64 involved? Uh, so quickly, uh, what is the easiest way to hide data on a Linux system? Anyone? Anything? What? All right, I, I, I was just messing with you. <laughs> yeah, so let's start with the IoT hacking simplified. Uh, all right, a uh, little bit about me. I am the director for R&D at uh, Pi2 Software Labs. I look after the research on uh, IoT security. Uh, other than that, we organize two conferences, one in Goa called Nalcon Security Conference, and uh, one in uh, Den Haag here called uh, Hardware.io. Uh, we've started this conference a couple of years ago. This conference focuses only on hardware security. Yeah, and other than that, I keep doing some uh, small open source uh, development and I do trainings on um, uh, IoT security as well. All right, after the, so this is what we're gonna talk about. I made this presentation very small and uh, simple because I had only uh, 30 minutes. I hope I'll be finished before that as well, okay. So what we're gonna discuss about is uh, uh, what are the IoT security issues uh, what is the attack surface in general? Uh, and what is the problem statement, which is the core of uh, the presentation? Uh, what did we uh, find in our IoT security pen tests? And that made us to uh, take a decision to create a framework for pen testers so that you, know, you don't have to uh, uh, try different uh, uh, security tools. So that's what we're gonna talk about a little bit about uh, uh, the framework and then we're gonna move uh, into the trends and uh, issues and we're going to look at some uh, very apparent issues in uh, IoT protocols with uh, small demos using the framework. All right, so these security issues are not new. I mean, they're, they're, they're de derived from software security itself. Uh, A, since there's a lot of uh, talk about IoT, everybody wants to jump the bandwagon and say that you know we are IoT vendors. So what they do is uh, they have to let go of uh, a lot of things in their uh, software development life cycle. So because they have to reach the market quickly, speed to market is important because if you don't do, your competitors will go ahead. And then because of the cost of hardware and uh, uh, the ease with which you can uh, develop uh, quick products uh, for IoT. A uh, lot of people are uh, creating different products. I mean, some of the products are at intermediary stage. They're going to die out in near future, but uh, still it gives you a, a chance to reach uh, the market and at least uh, create uh, a market space for yourself. So, and, uh, so what, what happens with this is people say, okay, we'll first reach the market and then we will look at the security issues. Very typical for software uh, companies, software vendors as well in the uh, early 90s and 2000s. So this is nothing new here. Uh, we've, in our uh, research and pen tests, we've seen that they've, uh, some of the startups do not even follow basic hygiene when it comes to uh, at least doing functional testing. So, so the products will not work. Uh, we've seen debug libraries being uh, uh, put in the products uh, in the mobile apps and, and, and yeah. uh, too many protocols. So this is one major thing that I, when I speak to uh, vendors or startups, IoT startups, uh, they do not pick up protocols because, uh, because of the way it should work, but they pick up because they think that you know, people are using it so it's going to be uh, uh, good for us as well. I mean, there are protocols which have standard usage, but you have, as a vendor and as the purpose of the product, you have to define which protocol is suitable for, for you, 
based on what the protocol uh, capabilities are, not because you know some protocol is uh, uh, fairly famous. And then when you get confused, uh, you say, let's chuck it. Let our communication is very simple. We just have to send a command, and we just have to get a response, and that's it. If we want to turn it, turn the sensor on, we send the on command. If we want to turn it off, we send the off command. But there could be security impl implications, so we add authentication. And if you are really good, then you would say, OK, in, on top of authentication, we will also add encryption. But the problem is the moment you start implementing your protocol, you are going to put in a lot of security issues. So even if, let's say, you are implementing uh, encryption in the communication, but you have hard-coded the, uh, the keys uh, within the product, and those keys are hard-coded for each and every product, it's just useless. It doesn't make sense. And then low motivation for security uh, for startups, financial reasons, for uh, uh, standard vendors, uh, low awareness. I mean, there are also uh, big companies who invest a lot in, uh, in uh, IoT security testing. All right, so the attack surface, if you look at it from a very high level, uh, this is according to me. Uh, one of the biggest components is the device itself. Uh, you will typically have, uh, if it's like an embedded Linux uh, device, you will typically have services running on the device. Uh, you may have external storage for the device, not very common for small sensors, but yes. Uh, we've even managed to own the device only by accessing, uh, accessing it through uh, the USB. Uh, then the firmware. Uh, most of the vendors will not encrypt their firmware, and then there are ways to get the firmware from uh, the hardware directly. And yeah, and then finally is the hardware. Most of the startups that we talk to or vendors we talk to actually have no idea about this because they're not hardware companies. They're vendors. They, uh, uh, they, they are inno uh, innovative companies. They come up with a product idea, and they're... Uh, whole aim is to create the product. So they won't get down to creating their own hardware. They would rather purchase the hardware from uh, uh, different vendors. And when it comes to hardware security, they have, they would use the default hardware as it is and just create their own uh, implementation within the firmware and that's it. Next is the, uh, the cloud. Uh, this, according to me, is going to be the biggest uh, uh, security threat and we'll cover that how so uh, for cloud you have standard uh, 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 security issues like communication with the device communication with the, the mobile app uh, storage of the data how how would you go about uh, storing the data uh, business log logic flaws within your implementation on the cloud and typical uh, interface uh, security issues which are very much covered by OWASP top 10 and so I like to assume that we are pretty good at when it comes to at least uh, uh, application security issues. And the third is uh, the mobile. So if you have an IoT uh, uh, product, you will have uh, an, uh, a mobile app which the user can use to see the data. Uh, and then for uh, security issues, Again, standard security issues. Communication with the sensor, communication with the cloud, uh, the storage, uh, how the data is stored. Uh, so typically for uh, some of the devices which are not on uh, uh, traditional TCP IP network, like uh, uh, devices that have, uh, uh, that are Bluetooth enabled, devices that have Zigbee, would, would typically not do a firmware upgrade if uh, they actually have a firmware upgrade uh, uh, capability. That would either go through the mobile app for Bluetooth uh, uh, devices or go through a smart hub in case of uh, Zigbee or other uh, radio protocols. So then those devices like the mobile, uh, mobile device and the IoT uh, gateway became, become the uh, attack surface for uh, accessing the hardware or uh, the firmware. All right, so this is where it starts. So you're getting ready for a pen test. You've recently got a project for uh, uh, doing a pen test for a really good uh, uh, 
uh, uh, interesting IoT product, something uh, uh, within a vehicle, uh, really James Bond style product, and uh, you're all happy about it. You say, okay, let's uh, let's get ready, and uh, I'm going to beat the shit out of this product. You know, I'm, I've been doing security for so many years, and this shouldn't be that hard, right? So let's get with it. And once the product is shipped, this is what happens. Then you have, okay, let me look through HackRF. Okay, no, uh, somebody says Lime STR is good. Okay, there is, the, uh, the fucking UI is not working for this product. Okay, let, let me look the communication protocol first. No, let me look at the app first. Let me look at the firmware. Okay, which tools, okay. It's not, the firmware is not being uh, 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 unpacked by a, cer a certain tool. Which other tools? Then you go into the net, you find another tool, of which is an open source tool. But uh, it's not mature enough, so it, it's again failing. So you move on to the next tool. So it creates a mess. And the reason for that is this. You have too many interfaces when it comes to IoT ecosystem. You just don't have to test one thing. You have to test n, n number of things. You have uh, your cloud, you have your mobile, uh, you have your device, within device you have a lot of things, within mobile you'll have a lot of things, cloud, uh, and then there'll be n number of tools. So how many tools and how many software are you going to purchase? Well, there are no uh, good commercial tools available to do IoT uh, security assessments as of now. There are a lot of open source tools uh, available, but some are mature and some are really on the development stage. So, so what do you do? Then you stop and start writing your own uh, simple scripts. And then you waste a lot of time on writing that script and that script may not be used for the next one year or two years. So we sat down, uh, we started thinking what can we do to reduce this gap where you don't have to you know, uh, go ahead and read on certain things and uh, compile, download, compile, uh, try different tools which may or may not uh, uh, help you. And then we came up with a solution. So meet Exploity. Uh, we are trying to create a framework for IoT exploitation as well as uh, penetration testing. Uh, we are going to limit the framework only for IoT, so we're not going to do standard web things on this. Just doesn't make sense because there are already a lot of commercial tools available for doing uh, web security testing, for example. The main goal is to use this tool for uh, research purposes, and once, uh, let's say after five years, when you have uh, uh, smart uh, cities or smart infrastructure enabled uh, places, so you go inside a building and everything is smart. It's not uh, implemented everywhere right now, but given, uh, given let's say five or maximum 10 years, everything is going to be automated. So we can't run away from that. Uh, so how do you go about doing penetration testing for that? So that's the uh, basic aim for this framework. Uh, so the design goals for this tool were simple. Uh, we wanted it to be very simple to use by people, I mean, there should not, uh, there should not be a learning curve when you're using uh, this particular tool. Uh, it should be extendable, so anybody who uh, wishes to extend uh, the framework's capabilities or create uh, test cases, create exploits, uh, should be able to easily create uh, the test case. So uh, the idea within the framework is that everything is a test case. So whether it's an exploit or whether it's uh, information gathering or anything that uh, is not part of uh, uh, the core utility is a test case. So you want to just scan the network, that's a test case. You want to exploit a particular device, that's a test case. You want to test a particular interface on a device, that is uh, a, a test case. Okay, so yeah, so this is how the architecture is. It is a very simple, I mean, it's just a uh, two months effort now. So we have uh, the framework ready as of now and some simple uh, test cases that you can test against uh, uh, some of the protocols. We'll come to that <coughs> later. So you have uh, the protocol cap uh, uh, module within the framework which will allow you to uh, use any any protocol that you want. For example, if 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 you're talking about uh, TCP IP based protocols, uh, you should be able to use, for example, MQTT, uh, COPE, which are already implemented. If it's radio, 
then uh, this should provide you the functionality where you can uh, only uh, hook on to the functionality from the protocols and just say, okay, Zigbee protocol, send this or connect or whatever. Uh, you have uh, a test suite engine, which basically loads all your test case, goes into the command system. So right now you only have the, uh, the console. You know, we don't have a fancy GUI for it, but it's pretty handy. So all the user needs to do is just uh, uh, go through the console and run the uh, test cases. Okay, so we have a couple of MQTT uh, tests. We have a couple of uh, COPE tests. We have a board scan test. Uh, we have uh, one exploit for uh, a smart plug where we basically found the uh, encryption key. All right, let's go to, so I'll just give you uh, an idea about uh, the framework. And with that, I'll just do one, uh, one demo. All right, so this board scan, so if you just say run H, you will see all the listed test cases that are there, and you can choose which test case you want to run. So for example, we are running board scan H, it will give you the description and uh, the parameters for that test case. So as the description says, this is shamelessly stolen from dev ttys zeros uh, border dot ty, which is a very, very uh, handy script. So, I mean, I'm thankful to him. The logic for uh, uh, the board scan is taken from uh, uh, his script. And what it does is basically it tries when you connect. So we have a small uh, test board here. We created this uh, uh, test board. We call it Diva uh, Vulnerable Test Board. Uh, just to, this is used for our training, just to teach people how do you go about looking at different interfaces on the board. Uh, and it's running a temperature sensor uh, on a specific uh, uh, on a specific baud rate at UART. So it has a uh, UART connection. So uh, one of the things that you would do on a pen test is to look at the UART uh, uh, port on a device. And once you find it, you interface it with PC, and you can actually access it directly through any standard uh, uh, hyper terminal tools like Minicom, uh, Screen, or uh, Terra term, um, there are a lot of uh, 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 tools available to do that. Anyway, so the idea is uh, uh, once you know the UART port, then you have to go and find the uh, uh, baud rate for that particular uh, uh, UART or serial connection. Now, th the standard baud rate is 115200, but there are uh, vendors who would put different baud rates, and then you will have to waste a lot of time connecting to it every time, uh, trying to find out what the particular baud rate for uh, the device is. I'm already connected to the device. Okay, let's pray to the demo gods and hope this works. All right, so the demo gods are angry. Sorry. My stupidity. Okay, so it's just going to take some time because it prints the temperature on the screen. So what it does is just cycles through standard uh, baud rates uh, and tries to see if it's actually getting valid uh, uh, information on the, uh, the UART uh, output port. So we'll just wait for some time. It's become a little slow. There it is. So the moment it finds uh, valid data on uh, the UART port, uh, 
but that's uh, the particular border for a device. All right. So let's go into the roadmap for the device. Uh, the next thing that we are going to put is BLE support for this because we're really struggling to find a good um, uh, tool to do uh, customized uh, BLE uh, scans and BLE testing. And there, there are tools available to do that, but they do not give you uh, that much flexibility. And uh, next up is the hardware interfacing. So we're probably going to create small, small uh, break, breakout boards to do specific testing for, uh, for example, uh, looking at uh, uh, the communication protocol for uh, the memory chips that are there, uh, looking at the debug uh, uh, communication that is there on the microcontrollers. Uh, radio support, we're probably uh, going to do it next year, most likely. So we're going to start with uh, Zigbee. Uh, there are already a few implementations. One is KP radio, so we're just looking at how do we hook uh, those implementations within the uh, framework. I, I don't want to go and implement everything from scratch if there's already something really good uh, to do a specific uh, uh, test. Uh, firmware analysis test case, and obviously uh, the, the core part, which is more IoT exploits. So if you know people who have been writing uh, any uh, IoT exploits, please uh, uh, tell them about this project and if they are interested in sharing the details, even if I'm, I'm okay, I'm, e even if they don't want to develop the test cases, I'm okay to develop the test cases myself. But if they know about any really good uh, uh, exploits, I would be more than happy to port them on to the product. All right, so trends and issues uh, some of the things that we see l uh, a lot in the community is that uh, when you talk about IoT and they say, hey, we've owned this device and we've owned uh, that particular sensor and it's really cool. That is cool, but IoT hacking is not only about hardware hacking. There are a lot of, uh, lot of other components uh, 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 as part of uh, IoT, which if you try to attack, you may get... Um, uh, uh, you may be able to attack a larger surface rather than you know, focusing on one particular uh, device. So cloud, uh, I see as a uh, very important uh, factor for IoT vendors. Uh, things like uh, uh, free apps that we have right now, like Facebook, you know, we use Google a lot, where our data is actually being used by uh, the vendors. Uh, I think this is going to be the same case with IoT as well. Going uh, in the future, you're going to have devices uh, which the vendors will be happy to give away for free. The, uh, the, Im the important thing for vendors would be getting your data or getting whatever data the uh, sensor uh, gets from the real world, from your home, from your office, uh, from the hospital, wherever. Uh, and then try to make sense out of it and then maybe either sell it or do something with it. So if you attack the cloud, there are more chances that you can own the ecosystem rather than owning uh, one particular device because uh, ultimately these sensors uh, directly or indirectly will be accessed by the cloud or uh, controlled by the cloud. So, so if you attack the cloud, there is a better chance that you can uh, you can actually control uh, the whole line of products instead of you know, uh, a single product sitting in some building. And this is something that um, uh, I am starting to think that if the, the given the implementation of uh, uh, the protocols, yeah, so given the implementations of, of a protocols, it, it is t as of now fairly easy to get into the sensor networks or uh, the, uh, the device networks. Uh, all we need to do is test, uh, test malicious data going to the cloud. So you can act as a rogue uh, as uh, a device within uh, the sensor network or actually get into one, uh, 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 an actual device and then uh, start uh, sending malicious data to the cloud and see the uh, after effects of that. So the problems here is uh, custom protocols, which causes a lot of problems. 
uh, no default uh, authentication because wherever if if you do uh, a showdown or search for specific IoT protocols, you will find uh, uh, devices whether they are Honeypot or actual devices. I don't know. Uh, don't test for the industrial uh, systems. Test for rather uh, other protocols, and you will find devices which are open without authentication. Uh, which have uh, the uh, where you will have the ability to switch them on, switch them off, turn the alarm on, or or open the uh, lock or whatever you want to do. And the uh, finally is the discovery mechanism, which is really good uh, if you talk about IoT, uh, because the the whole idea is uh, automation, uh, machines talking to machines, M to M. So you will have to have a very simple and easy way in which one particular sensor can be provisioned within uh, a network. Your protocol has to have uh, the capabilities where it can do it without uh, human intervention. So you just turn it on and it finds its way uh, through the network. Uh, that's a really good thing. Uh, good thing for us in that is that it also allows you to do information gathering on the sensor network. So it will tell you about various interfaces or APIs available in the network and uh, you can try and test each uh, one of the APIs. And uh, yeah, cloud is, uh, if the data is coming from your sensor network, it is typically uh, uh, trusted. So that it's coming from uh, a, a sensor, it's okay. I mean, this should not, ideally, this should not be the case. So any data coming in from, uh, uh, to the cloud, whether it's from a human or whether it's from a uh, sensor, should be treated as tainted. Unless, uh, uh, and if you are going to use it, and maybe it is going to end up somewhere in some uh, web UI. All right, so we'll just do small, three small demos here. One, I'm going to use the COPE protocol. So the protocol itself uh, uh, specifies uh, a way in which you can query the services on the protocol. So COPE is constrained, uh, constrained application protocol. It's a UDP-based protocol where you send the request to a COPE endpoint, and the COPE endpoint will uh, send a response to you. It is heavily derived from HTTP. The only changes that are made are that uh, it's not a text, fully text-based protocol. So a lot of things have been changed from uh, uh, text to uh, binary data. For example, it uses uh, the standard itself defines uh, four requests, uh, which are your REST uh, API requests, get, put, post, and delete. Uh, it defines uh, the uh, uh, options which are similar to headers which you send on in a uh, in a in an HTTP request like the host, the URI path, content uh, format, and other other things. So the protocol defines all standard uh, uh, options, but they are not text based. So the option is just a bit, and the value may be text. So it makes the protocol very simple, small, and can be easily translated from COPE to uh, proxy. So the protocol goes ahead and explains uh, uh, COPE proxies as well, where you can proxy the data from COPE to uh, HTTP directly. And then there is another RFC uh, 6690, which defines how you can find out uh, the services, well-known services on a COPE endpoint. So all you need to do is just access this particular URL. Let's go and see how it looks. I have the COPE endpoint here. So I have the COPE get text here. All it does is uh, it will query californium.eclipse.org, which is just a COPE test server uh, installed or deployed by Eclipse. So you can use it for uh, testing purposes. So this is how it looks like. You send the request. The request, the response comes back, and then you can do whatever uh, you want to do with the response. This is just a test server, so you're going to get uh, test response. And then you go ahead and look at the core uh, or the well-known uh, services on the COPE endpoint, and it gives you a blah, 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 lot of stuff. So these are this is basically, it's a very small protocol, a very simple protocol to understand. These are the resource paths that you can access. So now with this information, you can go ahead and test each of these, uh, uh, sorry, yeah, 
each of these uh, resource paths on the server and see if you can put data, very good. If you can delete data, very, very good. And if you can somehow control the sensor with uh, a particular request that looks like slash control slash power off, very good, right? Time's up. Okay, I'll better hurry. All right. So the next one is uh, MQTT uh, client uh, denial of service. So the way M so MQTT is a simple protocol. Uh, it's a publish and subscribe protocol where you have uh, an MQTT broker in between, and the clients or endpoints can publish messages to a specific uh, topic. Uh, that's what they call it, uh, and you can subscribe to a specific topic. So from a sensor can send. Uh, 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 for example, the, uh, the actual temperature of a room to a topic that is for that specific room and the subscriber can then know the value of uh, the actual temperature at uh, the room. Uh, so the way it works is ev whenever you connect to the MQTT uh, uh, broker, you have to specify a client ID which the protocol says has to be unique. The problem here is that uh, the, the one of the most famous implementation which is Mosquito uh, server for MQTT, I think it's, uh, the website is mosquito.org. Uh, what uh, they do is that if you're connecting as uh, uh, a client, uh, known client ID, it will disconnect the previously <coughs> connected client. So in case, so you go ahead, look at the, uh, the client ID uh, generating, uh, generation algorithm for the devices, or you go and hook on uh, the MQTT uh, topics as well. There are MQTT topics uh, available for system information uh, exchange, and the protocol defines that, which has nothing to do with applications. So typically applications should not have access to those, those information. So I'll just quickly do a small demo on this. So let's go and say run M QTT. I have a local MQTT server, Mosquito server running here. And I say subscribe to local host. And I say topic as temp or anything. ID is I say foo bar. Oops. Okay, so I've subscribed as uh, uh, the client ID foobar. I'll go ahead and just open another. Uh, this thing. And the topic actually does not matter. Uh, you can just connect to either for publishing data or subscribing. I'm just connecting to uh, subscribing. Right, let's take an example of this only. So I say ID here, the same foobar, and I get connected, and the previous one that was connected gets disconnected. So if you want, you can also see the logs, because the way I've configured it is to spit all the logs onto topics, which is an option, by the way, provided by uh, Mosquito server. All right, since the time is up, I'll just hurry. We have a last uh, uh, demo here to, uh, to actually inject malicious payload onto uh, the cloud. So if you know that this, this is irrespective of the protocol, the moment you know that the sensor data is actually somehow being communicated uh, uh, through either the gateway or the mobile app uh, to the cloud, and there is a way to actually see the data, uh, the easiest way is to start uh, uh, using known payloads.
where you can actually test uh, the cloud. So what I'm going to do is using the MQTT, I'm just going to put uh, uh, a, uh, an XSS uh, script within the data. Now, uh, the idea here is that the cloud will trust the data that is uh, coming in from uh, the sensor. Topic. Topic is temp and messages. Let's say twenty-two point uh, or twenty-three point five. And uh, I have a fake uh, application running here, which is specifying the temperature of the engine room, just to make it look more dramatic. And I send the data from the sensor and it says, okay, the temperature is uh, 23.5 uh, because it's reading in from the MQTT broker and somehow managing to get that data over to the UI. So now, now let's go ahead and uh, instead of uh, 23.5, let's just send a uh, script data here. Right. Yes. Let's wait. And done. And yeah. So simple. Now the idea here is to test each and every payload, not just XSS. This is just one example to show you that you can test the moment you know that your uh, data from the sensor is going into the cloud and somehow landing up into the uh, uh, the admin's UI or you know, vendor's UI or user UI for for example. It may even end up into mobile UI uh, as well. All right, I think I'm pretty much done here. So uh, the idea was here to give you an introduction to uh, the, uh, the exploity framework. And uh, if you have, if you think you can send me some information on uh, any of the exploits or uh, other techniques that I can include into the framework, I'd be more than happy to do that. This is my email address, asim at uh, com. And yes, and uh, so I, I'll be releasing it pretty soon. I was supposed to release it uh, uh, before my talk, but the website is not ready yet. Uh, as it happens, we are lazy. Uh, I should be able to uh, bring up the website in like a week or two at the max. Uh, if you want act the source code, I can even send you before that. Just send me an email and I'd be happy to do that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks very much, Asim.